This is something that I've been uh, spending a lot of time thinking about. The politics, I guess, is forcing this issue into all of our faces right now in a way that uh, is kind of disorienting, I suppose. I know some of you are um, perhaps looking at maybe your first election, and others have, have been around longer and have voted in, um, in a lot of them. As a journalist, it certainly uh, has been unprecedented in my mind. And there's a certain fact that came out just a few months ago that really struck me. Uh, at the beginning of 2015, there were 72 chapters of the KKK across the United States. By the end of the year, meaning by the end of 2015, there were 190 chapters of the KKK. So the question I was asking myself and asking the experts that I knew is, how did the KKK, a group whose heyday is nearly 100 years ago, how did it expand so significantly in just 12 months? 72 chapters to 190. That's about two and a half times as many chapters in just one year. Well, part of the answer is kind of mundane. Uh, there was an internal dispute of some sort, a schism. You, know, you had certain chapters of the Klan who were kind of breaking away from other chapters because apparently <laughs> white nationalists don't always agree with each other. More importantly, however, the answer lies in the events of June 17th, 2015. This was the day when Dylan Roof walked into a church in Charleston, South Carolina. Now, as many of you probably recall, Dylan Roof uh, was 21 and he's white. And he entered the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, and he took part in a Bible study. Then he stood up and allegedly gunned down nine parishioners, including a state legislator. All of them were black. I say allegedly because, although for some of you, Dylan Roof may be a fading memory, he's only been charged, and he hasn't been convicted yet. He's still awaiting trial at the Charleston County Detention Center. In fact, he was recently beaten up by a fellow inmate, Dwayne Stafford, who's black and who managed to get past all sorts of security measures and this pretty serious security cordon that was implemented just for Dylan Roof, specifically meant to keep him safe from other inmates. Stafford has since enjoyed a bit of internet celebrity. I'm not sure if any of you caught that a few weeks ago. So Dylan Roof is not guilty yet, but we seem to know a few things about him. He reportedly told cops that he wanted to start a race war, that he felt blacks were taking over the world. He wanted racial segregation. There were all sorts of things he apparently said to cops and to his friends. But is the image of Dylan Roof that I think conveyed more than anything else. He wore his hair in a sort of a bowl cut that made him look kind of childish and silly. And he liked to pose with the Confederate flag. And it's this image, combined with the horror of the church suitings, this is what reverberated throughout Charleston and the state of South Carolina and throughout the entire South in the immediate aftermath of the shootings. <coughs> Dylan Roof holding a Confederate flag and in the other hand, a gun. In response to the shootings, the governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley, called for the Confederate flag to be taken down from the state capitol. The governor, I should add, is a Republican and she's also Punjabi. Her parents are Sikh immigrants from India. Her dad wears a turban. And he once told me and a room full of Indians that when he moved to South Carolina in the 1970s, little Nikki, his daughter, and her sister both entered a pageant. And the judges were in a bind because they had an award for the best white girl and an award for the best black girl but they didn't know what to do with these talented little brown girls. It's the 1970s. So at intermission, they took the two girls aside and they disqualified them. But first they let them take the mic and sing, this land is your land. So they did. Now, Governor Haley came in as a star of the Tea Party. And in the conservative tradition, one doesn't make too much of one's ethnicity and certainly not of the weird racial bigotries that define one state. But the Charleston shootings were a pivotal event, and the nation's eyes were upon her. The whole world, in fact. Because the international community is fascinated by America's racial discourse, how our country can be at once 
this beacon of freedom and opportunity, but also at the same time just so deeply riven by its history of brutality and racism. So the question was, would the governor, the first woman to serve as South Carolina's governor, would she successfully have the flag removed? And it was during this period that the Washington Post published an article. And in the article, Nikki Haley recounted the story. One day, she said, she and her father drove to the city of Columbia to buy produce at a fruit stand. And a couple cops were called to the stand to keep their eyes on this man. The officers just stood at the register until Haley's father, wearing his turban, made his purchase. And she recalled, I remember how bad that felt. And my dad went to the register, shook their hands, said thank you, paid for his things, and not a word was said going home. I knew what had just happened. That produce stand, she said, is still there. And every time I drive by it, I still feel that pain. I realized that the Confederate flag was the same pain that so many people were feeling. And the headline of this article was, Nikki Haley went from Tea Party star to a leader of the New South. And ultimately, the flag did come down from the state capitol in Charleston. And Nikki Haley looked like a true leader. But on the ground, things weren't quite so simple. A whole lot of people started placing Confederate flags on their lawns. And there were all these Confederate flag bumper stickers that started showing up in cars. And there were a lot of rallies. The Southern Poverty Law Center documented 364 rallies in support of the Confederate flag. And it's within this climate, the center says, a climate of fear and of loss, the threatened loss of one of the most potent symbols of white supremacy, that the KKK saw the growth which I spoke of earlier. <coughs> People were genuinely activated, they were mobilized, especially as opposition grew to remove, to remove other symbols of Confederate history, like statues. One rally in Florida drew around 5,000 protesters. A rally in North Carolina drew about 4,000 and featured signs reading, Southern Pride, but also, all lives matter. Within weeks of the flag going down in Charleston, there were 23 rallies across Virginia and 19 in Texas. But it wasn't just in the South, and this was, is what I think is really interesting. There were rallies in Ohio, in Michigan, and in Indiana, as well as Minnesota, a bunch in Pennsylvania and in Arizona, even as far as Oregon and the state of Washington. And at many of these rallies, Rallies that took, took place, let me remind you, because a young man took out a gun and shot nine innocent sh churchgoers, people brought their own guns. As if to say, we're not just gonna walk away from this, okay? So you have all these rallies happening across America, and some of the people are just regular folks showing up in regular clothes, but sometimes it's members of hate groups like the KKK. And I've been especially curious about these people, the members of hate groups, because these groups are apparently growing. So I asked someone who talks to members of hate groups a lot. His name is Brian Levin, and he's the head of the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at Cal California State in uh, San Bernardino. I'd seen his name in an article about a Klan rally in Anaheim outside of Los Angeles. What exactly do they complain about? What exactly motivates them? And he said, there are a few things. <coughs> immigration, they're worried about immigration. They're worried about what's called Sharia law. Have any of you heard of this, Sharia law, this term? Sharia law is sort of something that motivates uh, certain people in conservative circles. The idea that um, Muslims are gonna move in and uh, because they're not faithful to the American Constitution, so the theory goes, um, they wanna have their own sort of a constitution. They wanna overthrow, overthrow uh, the country and, and impose their own constitution, Islamic values, all these things which are completely not um, justified, but it's a theory, and it's very popular in certain circles. And finally, he said they are worried about what they call white cultural genocide, and a system that is bent on the destruction of white America. Or America. And finally, he wrote, he almost kind of just threw this in, he said they like Trump a lot. So this is where we are today. One week from the election, it's next Tuesday, and Donald Trump is the favorite of the KKK and virulent anti-Semites, as well as people who pine for the Confederacy.
Now, many people have said this is the most momentous election, American presidential election in our lifetimes. And you know, it goes without saying, Americans like to kind of exaggerate. Um, but I'm in my 40s, I'm a middle-aged guy, and I don't think it's much of an exaggeration. And this goes well beyond one individual or <laughs> one candidate. The broader question, I think, is how much anger is there under the surface? We're not even really under the surface anymore. What is the depth specifically of white rage? And to what extent do white Americans, the people who apparently like Donald Trump, to what extent do they feel that race relations is a zero-sum game? And by zero-sum, I mean this. If African Americans are to gain, if Hispanics are to gain, if Asians are to feel fully American, then does all of that mean that whites need to lose something? This is a question that I constantly ask myself, and I don't have any easy answers to this. But in order to understand it better, I've needed to educate myself about American history. And I'm not a historian, OK? I'm a journalist. Um, but I do what I can. So let's step back for a few minutes. For centuries, Europeans and their descendants have been the undisputed winners on this con uh, continent. They went from being a few hundred people in the early 1600s, dwarfed by Native American populations, to the overwhelming majority of the population on this continent. From the 1800s through the early 1900s, the 1910s, the 1920s, up through the 1950s, 1950s rather, white Americans comprised about 90% of the population. That figure held pretty steady for a very long time. And it was during this period of white demographic dominance that the architecture of Jim Crow was built up. However, white supremacy took on various forms. It resulted in laws that prevented non-whites from voting or establishing political power. It resulted in ideas like eugenics, the notion that some people are genetically superior to others and that others are unfit. Years before the Nazis came to power, eugenics was a well-developed American ideology. And it received significant funding from leading philanthropic, uh, philanthropic groups in the US. And it also received intellectual heft from the nation's leading scholars. White supremacy demeaned non-Western spiritual traditions and forms of worship, as well as aesthetic traditions, forms of art. Because of white supremacy, the US severely restricted immigration from China, India, and other non-Western countries. The president of the American Sociological Association warned in 1901 that Asian migration would, read, would lead to, quote, race suicide for whites. And of course, white supremacy resulted in segregation. And while eugenics seemed to have faded away, segregation lives with us and will continue to in certain forms for generations. The last few months, I've been spending a lot of time in the suburbs, Long Island, talking to people about why they want Donald Trump to become president. And as the name of our podcast suggests, it's called the United States of Anxiety. This is a very anxious time for a lot of people, but especially for longtime residents of Long Island, the suburbs, people who moved to Long Island a long time ago, the 1950s and 1960s. That's when um, a large portion of the population in New York City, about half a million people just in the 1950s, moved out of the city. Uh, the suburbs aren't the place they used to be for these people. So what kind of place was it? Well, for decades, a dominant image of the suburbs was conveyed by magazines, TV shows, and movies. I grew up with a lot of these shows. Leave it to Beaver, The Brady Bunch, Father Knows Best, Bewitched, probably shows that a lot of you have never heard of, and some of you watched when they came out. All of them, all these shows were set at nice homes, okay? They had nice lawns out front, the dad was usually in charge. Well, the dad was always in charge. And the problems were pretty trivial. Nobody was poor. There were no poor people. There were no black people. There were no Hispanics in these shows. Um, and as a kid, I didn't think to question these things. I was growing up in Houston. That was just the reality that I knew. This is our entertainment. Um, but in truth, the suburbs were highly segregated. So these shows were actually conveying something that was accurate. The most famous suburban community, Levittown, was built on Long Island in the late 1940s, right after the war. Has anybody heard of Levittown? Yes. Yes. Sure. It was an all-white community. No Hispanics or African Americans allowed, even if they helped build these homes. 
Levittown was such a huge success that the Levitt family decided to build other Levitt towns across the country, including one in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'd like to show you a part of a short documentary now. It's about the fight to integrate Levittown in Pennsylvania. This is the second Levittown after one in, in New York. But really what it's about is the fear that white residents had over a single black family moving in. A couple of points, okay? It's been trimmed down in somewhat disjointed ways, and the score is kind of bizarre. The music uh, seems completely like disjointed from what, what they're talking about. This is Levittown, Pennsylvania, a new suburban community of 60,000 people midway between Philadelphia and Trenton, New Jersey. With its giant shopping center, winding lanes named for flowers and trees, it is fairly typical of communities all over America, where families are pursuing the American dream to give their children a better chance in life. In August 1957, Levittown, Pennsylvania attracted international attention when violence erupted as William Myers Jr. and his family moved into the three-bedroom house at Daffodil and Deep Green Lanes. In almost all respects, the Myers family is close to the Levittown norm. They have three small children, the youngest only one month old. Myers served for two and a half years in the Army and was discharged as a staff sergeant. He works as a laboratory technician and is studying for a degree as an electrical engineer. His wife, Daisy, is a college graduate. The Myers home is modestly furnished and their late model family car was bought on time. They are very close to the Levittown norm, except in one respect. William Myers, Jr. and his family are Negroes in an all-white community. Some view the incident calmly and indicate acceptance of the fact. But for others, the Myers moving into Levittown constitutes an infringement of their own liberties. And we understood that it was going to be all white, and we were very happy to buy a home here. How about your children? Have you talked with them about the Myers? We have tried to keep uh, the discussions away from the children. Uh, I figure, I, I feel that it's something that uh, we adults should solve without bringing the children into it any more than we have to. We're doing it for the children, but I don't feel that they are old enough to understand the problem as it is. Do you think a Negro family moving here will affect the community as a whole? Definitely. In what way? I think that, well, the property values will immediately go down if uh, they are allowed to move in here in any number. And what of the dream of middle-class respectability? If a Negro family can afford what you can afford, how do you justify your feeling of superiority? What other objections, aside from the effect on property values, do you have against the Meyer? He's got three children. And uh, evidently, he feels that they will be accepted socially. And uh, I don't feel that they ever will be. But the whole trouble with this integration business is that uh, in the end, it probably will end up with, with mixing socially. And you will have, well, I think their aim is mixed marriages and becoming equal with the whites. Do you intend to move? At the time, no. It's a pretty impossible situation. We have, uh, we have our home here, and if the colored move in, and run real estate values down, there are a lot of us, the GIs particularly, who are going to be more or less stuck with their homes. As the lines are drawn, those on either side become more adamant. Tension develops and feeds on suspicion and mistrust. What has been the effect of the Myers coming here? Well, it's, it's created a great deal of tension, not uh, among the neighbors, because we all feel the same. But uh, it's naturally made Everyone tents in their home. But there are others who are for the Myers? Yes, I've read about them. For what reason, do you think, do they support the Myers? Frankly, I don't know what reasons they can have for it. 
If there are homeowners in Levittown, I don't see what reasons they can have for it. Do you think Myers will be able to live here comfortably? Comfortably? No. What course of action are you going to follow? I'll do what I can uh, to help to, to get them out legally and peacefully. And as far as accepting them socially, if that's what you mean, I could never do that. Do you think the Myers will be able to live comfortably in Levittown? I think so. I hope so. I think the majority of people here will uh, grow accustomed to it and uh, realize that, oh, they, are, they can be good neighbors, which I'm sure they are. And uh, I think the majority of people here are not vi the violent, um, well, violent group that we have heard so much about marriages and that's eventually what it's going to come to if children are raised together they're not going to think of anything of marrying together well i just could not live beside them i don't feel that they should be oppressed but i moved here one of the main reasons was because it was a white community and that's the only place i intend to live if i have to leave levittown i will do so as elsewhere in America, there are those who believe that the rights and privileges of citizenship belong to all, regardless of their race or color or creed. People have evidently no problem saying these things on TV. They can't imagine any possible backlash or consequence to what they're saying, because they live in a bubble. And that's the, that's the price of segregation, is you imagine that there's nobody outside of your immediate circles, nobody who looks up unlike you or thinks unlike you. Second, intermarriage. See how, how quickly people talk about how scared they are that their kids are going to grow up and get together with uh, non-white kids. They're terrified of integration, rather, because it ultimately means sex. You know, this is very scary, and they have no problem in, uh, in, um, in betraying or rather revealing that thought, even as their little kids are running around them. And finally, market values. I find this very in interesting sort of point they keep on going back to. Americans could easily rationalize segregation in the post-war era because it was all about maintaining the value of your house and the ones around you. By allowing integration, you weren't being, like, you weren't being moral. You were being a bad neighbor, bad um, American, a bad, bad suburbanite. Remember, this is the late 1950s, and the Supreme Court had already ruled on Brown versus Board of Education, separate but equal, which had lasted as an idea a completely unimplementable idea since the late 1800s had been declared unconstitutional. And it wasn't going down without a fight. There are a lot of people who were fighting this. It took years to resolve this. But um, then we get into the into 1960s. The Civil Rights Act is passed. The Voting Rights Act is passed. And perhaps just as importantly, uh, in terms of its effect on today's politics and this, this campaign, this election that we're witnessing, the Immigration Act of 1965 was passed lifting the barriers that had kept so many people out of this country. In the 1960s, something else started happening. The portion of the population that was white, which I told you earlier was in the high 80s, around 90% for many, many years, it started slowly coming down. And today, it's down to the low uh, 60s. It's around 62, 63% of the population which is white. And there is a minority uh, rather, there's a countdown of, of sorts to that day, about 25 to 30 years from now, when whites finally will become a minority. It's already happened in certain states, but we're talking about nationally. Uh, in certain demographics, say younger kids, it is already happening. Uh, public schools on the whole are already um, what they call a majority minority, which means there's more um, non-white students in these schools than there are white students. Uh, some people say it's going to be this point nationwide is going to happen around 2042. Other people say 2044. Um, regardless of when it happens, though, there is a lot of anticipation. Um, I'm going to show you a, a brief bit of another clip. This is a, a, a stand-up comedy clip by a guy named Hari Kondabolu. Anybody heard of him? Uh, Hari is a very provocative comedian, very political, and. Um, this is from his album called, there you go. 
uh, this album is, 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 it came out a couple years ago. It's called Waiting for 2042. So you heard that cheer in the crowd, right? The idea that whites would eventually become a minority was exciting to some people. I'd even say there was a sort of gloating. People were kind of gloating about this, like any day now, right? Any day now, the thinking went, historically marginalized groups in America would wield a power such as they'd never experienced. Change was in the air. And this sort of thinking converged with what was happening across the country. It was in 2012 that a young black man, Trayvon Martin, was shot dead by George Zimmerman in a Florida subdivision. One year later, after Zimmerman was acquitted, the phrase Black Lives Matter became part of the public discourse. And there were a couple of things that made this new movement special. One, although it had a physical presence on the streets and could be observed in public, it was a product of social media, it felt new. Second, like Occupy Wall Street, which came before it and uh, where I spent a lot of time five years ago, it was not controlled by a single charismatic individual or a small group of people. It was fairly decentralized. This was all part of its appeal. And as we were bombarded by one video after another, each capturing the killing of yet another unarmed black man at the hands of police, each adding to the growing outrage, it seemed only a matter of time before things would change, that they must change. This is what the activists were saying. But it wasn't just activists. We witnessed the emergence of intellectuals, artists, musicians, ta Coates, Beyonce, Kendrick Lamar, Sean King, people who were willing to identify and attack white supremacy in their own respective ways. They amplified what was happening on the ground. They put it into a historical context, into an aesthetic context. They provoked us and made the realities of this country unavoidable. Of course, this was all happening against the backdrop of an Obama presidency, the nation's first black president governed during a time of heightened racial discourse. Not just racial discourse, the language and activism around gender relations has inten intensified in its own ways. And of course, it's intersected with racial discourse. We've seen terms like white privilege enter the vernacular, as well as male privilege. And news stories were increasingly framed around these kinds of terms and ideas. Remember the, the, the mess recently that Ryan Lochte got into the summer at the Olympics. There were all these articles that emerged right after that about how he epitomized white male privilege. All right? He wasn't just some sort of a bozo or a brat or you know, just a dumb guy. He was a bad white man. Suddenly, this was racialized in a way that it wouldn't have even five years ago. Here's another example. After a mass shooting in California a couple years ago, uh, Salon had the slightly <coughs> tortured headline, Elliot Rogers, Half White Male Privilege. What? Remember Elliot Roger, anybody? He shot all these people, uh, I think, on a college campus in California. Uh, he was half Asian and half white. He also killed himself right after that. Interestingly, the link to that Salon article made it to the website of Stormfront, which is the first major hate site on the internet. And I was looking at the comments uh, on this website, Stormfront, and most of the comments are pretty inane, but there's one that stood out to me. It said, leftist idiots will think of anything to criticize white males. Even when the perpetrator isn't white, the attack on males comes on extra hard. And I found this really interesting because Stormfront is about as bad um, as it gets in the world of white power, right? It's registered users by one estimate have been behind nearly 100 murders. All right, so this is sort of a safe space for the country's worst people. Um, but here you have this commenter who is inadvertently admitting that even for non-white men, life isn't all that easy. Um, he accidentally sort of sympathized with, with other people. Um, the fact is we're seeing a lot of change on multiple fronts. And this is disorienting for a lot of people, not just white supremacists. Um, I was uh, talking to a barber last year in Sunset Park. I was interviewing him. And he told me that most of his clients are black or Latino. And all the time they complain about this thing, political correctness, OK? It's not just white guys and you know, seriously privileged people. This is something that affects a lot of people.
Um, but more than anyone, it does affect white men. These are the people who have the most to lose. And these are the people who are being most directly challenged in our current era. Of course, they may not always see it that way. When they complain about something like Black Lives Matter, they'll point to the death of cops. This is about law and order, they'll say. And when they say immigration is a problem, they'll say they're specifically talking about illegal immigration. And it's not about Islam, it's about radical Islam. And in and of themselves, I think it's completely legitimate to make these distinctions. Uh, because there are people who argue in good faith about some of these things. But in its totality, the rhetoric, I think, is very worrisome, as is this presidential campaign we're witnessing. And it is of a piece with earlier periods of American history when outsiders were seen as direct threats to white supremacy. And the arguments we're hearing can't be divorced from the demographic realities, the fact that white people are declining in numbers and many are unprepared for the declining influence that comes with that. Well, unprepared also for the fuller portrait of America to emerge, the fuller history in changing textbooks, in changing newsrooms, in TV shows and movies with more diverse casts, in boardrooms and companies, and the demands that are coming for these places to all change with the changing America. There's a lot at stake, power, and wealth and dignity too. And regardless of who wins next week, the election is not gonna resolve the issues that are being debated. It's not gonna be the end of anything. Rather, I think this is gonna be a long, very traumatic process. And our commitment to democracy and to humanity is gonna be severely tested. I think I've heard about similar ideas that um, there was a PBS special a year or two ago about the people who were flocking from California, which is one of those majority minority states I mentioned earlier, um, to places like uh, Kurdaline, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it, Idaho. Idaho. Yeah. Is this one of the places you mentioned, you were thinking of? Yeah, these are places where um, I think this was, this town in Idaho was, has a history as being, you know, I don't know if it's a Klan center, or it's like the original place where some major white power organization happened. And there are people who are, like fleeing these more diverse places for places where they feel that they're um, more comfortable. And you know, sometimes they say like, you know, look, look at the life, it's nice, I've had nature and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think this is sort of part of a history um, similar to what happened in New York City in the 1950s, what I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, I don't know how many of you grew up uh, you know, in Queens or Brooklyn, but there are many communities in these places where white flight happened in incredible numbers. And uh, as you had these uh, communities in Queens, Brooklyn, elsewhere being integrated, um, people moving in from other parts of the country, uh, you had this thing called white flight. And it wasn't just something where people were like, oh, you know, I think I'm going to move on. Let's, the suburbs look pretty. There was a deliberate attempt to empty these communities out. Uh, politicians, real estate brokers, they all played a part. They would sort of ratchet up the fear the blacks are coming, and you better leave now. Uh, sell me your house um, in a hurry. And so they'd sell their house because they'd be fearful that they wouldn't be able to sell it in time. So they'd sell it at a low price to these, um, to these people, these middlemen. And those people, in turn, would, would resell it. They'd flip it to black um, buyers, in a sense, to help perpetuate the alarm, the panic that they were um, benefiting from. So you had all these people who were fleeing um, communities in these, um, in these towns. We, don't, we think of New York City as such a diverse place, right? But it is just as much sort of <sighs> implicated in the problems that we're, you know, we just talked about. Um, there are very segregated communities in New York City as well. It's a very segregated city. It's one of the most segre segregated cities. I think Madison and maybe Detroit are, are above, at least in black-white segregation. It's kind of shocking to think of ourselves, you know. We, don't, we think of ourselves as being like, you know, this rainbow city, right? Um, but, but what you're saying, it, it, is, it is amazing to see that kind of panic happening in different ways across the country now. Yeah, it's very worrisome, I think. This is my understanding of it as well as, um, you know, 50, 60 years ago, um, that there were more people seen as threats in some ways. Uh, Italians, Jews, um, Irish Americans. Um, some of these groups have sort of, um, I guess, been,
brought into the broader fold of whiteness is one way we, we have of looking at it. Um, back then as well, communists, you know, Jew meant communist, you know, that kind of a thing. Certain Europeans were seen as um, uh, threats. Um, and the laws a long time ago were specifically designed to keep out parts of, of Europe. So it was more Western European. Um, but now you have uh, other communities who are coming in. And so they're sort of adding to this latest chapters of who is now seen as the outsider? Who is going to come in and not embrace our American values? You know, who doesn't dress the way we want them to or pray the way we want them to? Um, uh, and so the refugee debate right now is, is, um, is sort of part of that. And it's, it's complicated in a sense by the fact that there's this fear of, um, oh, do we really know who these refugees are coming in? Now, the refugee resettlement process is incredibly elaborate. Um, it's about as elaborate as anything, the screening, uh, you know, for anything goes. Uh, um, so there shouldn't really be a fear. But people look at, across the Atlantic to, uh, to Europe, they see this huge refu refugee um, influx. Um, they see the borders being kind of breached. Um, they see terrorist acts happening. And it's scary. Um, and it's not just scary in and of itself. It's also, again, there's this whole drumbeat, you know, watch out, here they come. So it's not, um, there's a very, uh, there's an industry of sorts, a very well-funded industry that's given to sort of help um, make people terrified. There's really not that much Islamic terrorism in this country, you know. Um, there are other problems that are much bigger statistically. But, you know, a bombing it has a very visceral sort of a, you know, connection to people. And then, of course, there's all these other conspiracy theories about Sharia law and that kind of stuff. So, yes, I think you're right in terms of, you know, all these new chapters of, of who's seen as the outsider and who hate groups, you know, keep on changing their minds about about who the who, you know who the problem is. I do think, um, you know, ironic or tragic. Uh, I think, for me personally, uh, this process of of learning about these things has been, you know, almost a daily sort of um, kind of a revelation or a just. It's just so disturbing every day to learn new things as I'm learning about the history, the depth of America's, um, you know, not just slavery, reconstruction, um, and what came after it, and the, the daily attempts, the ongoing attempts to, to prevent people from voting, from living in certain neighborhoods. Um, and so, yeah, you do see these very different sort of stories of people who come here, um, you know, Chinese were not allowed to, to come for many years. Uh, or if they were allowed during certain stretches, they were only allowed as bachelors. You couldn't bring your family in because they were worried about the growth of these, like them settling down. Indians hardly came for decades. Um, and then you had a very specific immigration pattern. People like my dad and my, my, my parents who came um, around 1970. Um, the US said, OK, we're going to let them in, but we're going to prioritize people who have professional degrees, doctors and engineers. Mm -hmm. So today you have um, what wouldn't have been foreseen 40 or 50 years ago, which is that the wealthiest ethnic group in America is Asian Indi Indians, people from India. You know, um, there was for a very long this sort of idea that you know India is poor, it's backward, superstitious, um, incapable of getting on with the modern world, and now you have all these major success stories and. Um, I think part of the challenge for Indians who are not necessarily very aware of, of, our, of the history of this country or the ways in which we were kept out, because I'll tell you, most people um, that I grew up, they knew nothing about um, all the efforts to keep Indians, Chinese, other people out. There's a lot of ignorance there. Um, I think the challenge is understanding that it's not just because you worked harder. You, know? you weren't just born smarter and you came here and I kind of think. There were a lot of laws that were that kept um, what do you call it an unlevel playing field, um, and we've in some ways benefited from from some of the changes in ways that other ethnic groups haven't necessarily. So I've spent time in Patchogue, Bayshore, Belport, um, Ronkonkoma, um, mostly this area. I didn't go to the Hamptons because my editors wouldn't let me, <laughs> um, but. This is the area which we mostly spend time in, mostly Suffolk County. And the reason we picked Suffolk County 
specifically is because in the New York primary, what happened in March or April, um, Suffolk County had the highest, uh, in the Republican primary specifically, Suffolk County had the highest support for Donald Trump after Staten Island. So in the whole state, of all the counties that voted, I think it was 73% of Republican voters went for Donald Trump. Uh, it was actually 80% in Staten Island. Um, and we started looking you know, at the data and we said, isn't it funny that it's these suburbs, these exurbs in a ring around New York City where you have so much support for Donald Trump? And um, that's something we're still trying to make sense of. You know, there's something in the suburbs that's happened. There is a real sense of loss. Um, there are a lot of problems, genuine problems. You know? It's not just uh, the kind of stuff I was talking about. Uh, you have incredibly high property taxes in some of these places. It's crushing, you know? And it's very sad. You speak to somebody who's lived in a home for 50 years. Um, somebody I spoke to, uh, her name is uh, Pat Johnson. She's 81 now. Um, I spoke to her daughter a lot, um, Patricia. And we spent a lot of time with a few different people in these neighborhoods. And um, the mom, you know, she's lived in her same home for 50 years, and she just can't afford it. The property taxes are crushing, and you know, she was widowed about 10, 15 years ago. She's living on a fixed income. She's constantly drawing from her, de her, from her um, late husband's pension, and she just kind of broke down crying. Um, so there are these other aspects that I don't think get necessarily enough attention. Um, there's also a drug epidemic, uh, and I think a lot of people my friends in New York City don't necessarily know about how bad the drug epidemic is in places like Suffolk County. It's heroin and other opioids. Um, starting in the 90s, I think, the pharmaceutical industry started pushing these kind of medicines like OxyContin and very aggressively. And you might go in to the doctor with a relatively small you know, problem procedure, a little pain, maybe something that needed, say, Tylenol for a few days. <coughs> Pharmaceuticals say, no, 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 give this. This is even better. You've got to be aggressive about treating pain. And um, so the doctors would be like, oh, here's 30 days of OxyContin. You didn't necessarily need OxyContin in the first place. You didn't need opioids, highly addictive things. You needed maybe some pain relief. You certainly didn't need 30 days of it. So you have these medicine cabinets throughout these communities across America, which are overflowing with opioids. You have people middle-aged getting addicted. Um, and you also have younger people who are starting to come into contact with these uh, medications, uh, sometimes without their parents' knowledge. Uh, it doesn't take too long to become addicted to that. It's very expensive, though, and you can't keep on getting prescriptions, also, although sometimes that's what they did. They got fake prescriptions, or they got the doctor to give them more somehow. But what happened is um, heroin dealers started moving in onto these territories, knowing that they were um, here was sort of like a business opportunity. And they kind of started flooding these areas with cheap heroin, um, much cheaper than opioids, prescription medicines. Um, so people started becoming addicted very fast. And so um, there's a much higher rate of heroin overdose deaths in places like Suffolk County um, or Staten Island um, than there are in certain, say, urban uh, communities, and it's much more a problem in white communities, suburban and rural white communities, um, than it is in um, communities of color for the most part. And if Suffolk County and Staten Island look bad, it's so much worse in other parts of America, places like Ohio, Appalachia. Um, you know, it's devastating some of these communities, and. I'm kind of embarrassed because I feel like I should have known about this a long time ago, but this is sort of a story that the media was very slow to uh, kind of recognize. Um, I think for some people, they don't even think of it as a national crisis, but this is the worst drug epidemic in the history of America. It's much worse than the crack cocaine epidemic of the late 80s, early 90s was, or the earlier heroin epidemic of the late 60s and early 70s. These two, those two uh, epidemics combined are much smaller than the current epidemic. There's about 250,000 people who have died from this epidemic. And most people don't have any idea. And so I think in a weird way, this is sort of reflecting this changing America. Um, it hasn't been politicized so much. You probably haven't heard of Dr Donald Trump talk that much 
about um, addiction and how we need to curb this problem. But all we've, we've heard primarily from him, there's one aspect that we've heard, which is that um, drugs are entering this country. We need to stop the drugs from entering this country. So we need to build a wall. Um, that doesn't address the fact that there are a lot of people who are addicted. Um, and how do you address addiction, treatment, prevention? Um, how do you make sure that they're not being imprisoned? You know, uh, these are conversations that are happening across the country, and it's very unsettling for a lot of communities. So I think things like this are, um, you know, these are legitimate problems that are happening in a lot of communities, and it's sort of a shame that it has not really gotten. Uh, the full attention it needed to in this campaign season, because I think it's, um, you know, I think it's really part of the undercurrent of of the political problems we're seeing right now. It is such a strange reversal in a sense. Like on one hand, yeah, there is more of this humanization that's happening of people with this problem. You have a lot of uh, lawmakers who were um, conservative and who might have traditionally taken a very law and order approach to drug addiction, and you know, we got to get rid of these. Uh, you know, sleaze balls or whatever you low life, that kind of a thing. Um, and now, in a sense, they are talking more about it. But it, it, this is a problem 20 years in the making. Um, so I think I don't think we'll fully understand the weird ways in which this drug story has kind of unfolded um, for a while. It's scary. It's scary. And uh, I mean, I know more and more people who are who are worried for their safety. Um, I don't really worry for my safety walking around here in New York, but I do know reporters who, uh, um, I have a friend who's a black reporter and she refused to cover her Trump rally. She was scared, you know. Uh, you hear a lot of um, reports about uh, people in the press pen at Trump rallies, yes, yes. screamed at, called names, uh, very violent, you know. The language there can be very hostile. Um, what's happening on social media as well? Um, I have a coworker who, um, you know, the the amount of anti-Semitism he's dealing with, um, it's very unsettling. Uh, uh, people who wear headscarves, uh, turbans, um, other ways in which they are, I guess, is they stand out. There, um, there are many days where I hear them saying, like, you know what? I just don't know if I want to. Like, say something happens, some crazy incident happens, uh, some sort of terrorist scare or whatever. I hear people who say, like, um, I mean, I've seen uh, organizations which, like, you know, we're not, we're not going to work today. This happened recently. There was some part of a thing. I was in Chelsea. There was some sort of a scare a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, I saw people I know who were like, you know, we're not coming into work today because we are worried for our, for our safety. These are Muslims. Um, and I think that that's kind of a thing that say Hillary Clinton does win, uh, you're going to have a lot of people who are even more incensed. And we have no real, um, I guess, example in recent modern Amer American history to know what the, what the, um, you know, the consequences of this are going to be. Yeah. And it's almost like, uh, God forbid it should happen. You know, it's almost like they say, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're saying it's going to happen. It's almost like they're, they're, you know, you just kind of feed the beast. Um, put the word out there. You know, six or seven years ago, do you all remember the Fuhrer over the Ground Zero Mosque, as they call it, Part 51? Um, so I covered that a lot. And um, it was kind of bewildering to watch how this Islamic center with an imam who was completely like, you know, this soft-spoken guy with a long history of writing peacefully about Sufism and other, you know, and Islam, he became like this sort of like um, creepy, shadowy figure, like what is, who really is Imam Abdul, uh, Abdul Ruf? There was this attempt to make him look like an outsider when he'd lived in the country for many years. At that same time, I started looking across the Atlantic because in, a, in, in, um, in Europe, you have a longer history of Muslims who've been moving into these communities. Um, and there is a much more heightened sort of a campaign against uh, Muslims and Muslim presence um, in places like France, Marine Le Pen, um, Holland, parts of Eastern Europe. Uh, it's a mix now in the last few years of hostility towards refugees, 
and to Islam in general, um, and the fear of the outsider, um, again, that they don't conform. Uh, so a lot of people in America, uh, conservatives, were taking their cues very specifically. They were networking with people in those, in those spaces. They had conferences together. Um, they were using Europe as an example of what happens if you let these people in. And uh, there's a lot of data to show that Muslims in America are highly assimilated, you know, in terms of uh, economically, in civic sense, in other ways. Uh, this is coming from conservative groups like the Manhattan Institute. Um, but there's a campaign to say that, that that's not the case. You know, we should fear them. And it's very much in keeping with what's happening um, across the ocean. I'm not sure is the short answer. I think there will be components um, of the electorate who will say, you know, we tried that. I held my nose and voted for him. I know people like that who don't necessarily like him, but they think that he's better than she is. Um, you know, I think it depends partly on how much effort he puts into this after the election. Um, is he going to, you know, buy his own media outlet and become sort of like extreme Fox News? You know, I mean, I know people who, who, who are voting for Trump who are like, Fox News is too liberal for me. It's gotten too liberal recently. They don't feel like it represents um, you know, their views enough. Um, I think that gonna be, there's going to be enough of the population who is already really cynical. They don't believe in the system. They think Trump is the only answer. I mean, he himself tells you he's the only answer. Right? He's the only person who can make appropriate change. So I do think there are going to be some people who are going to be so sickened of this that they're going to um, look for more radical means of expressing you know, their grievances. Um, and like I said, some of them are legitimate and some of them are not legitimate. Um, and then there's some people who are just going to be like, they're just going to move on with life or go off the grid or whatever that means. You know? I don't know um, the reality of that. There's, Germany has been huge in terms of how many people have come there. Uh, it's very, been very, I don't really know how many people have gotten jobs. I know in some communities elsewhere, Part of the deal, say with France, is like, okay, we're going to relocate you. Um, I was in France for several weeks last year reporting on the refugees and other stuff. And so I saw these people start sleeping on the streets of Paris. It's really weird. The city, Paris, where, you know, it's like this beautiful place, and suddenly you see these, you know, people sleeping on sleeping bags or just on the pavement. And uh, months later, I was still following it, and I, and I saw the news that they were going to relocate them to other towns, but the deal was that they couldn't work. Because they didn't want those towns to say, wait, if they can get jobs, they're going to be competing with jobs w with our local guys. You know? The problem is then you have this other problem. is like, If they don't have jobs, what happens to a guy who's 22, 24, 28, and he's just sitting around all the time? You know? it's, a very difficult, it's a very difficult situation. I, don't actually, I wish I knew the specifics of Germany in terms of what, what this is. I mean, Angela Merkel, the, uh, the, uh, the prime minister, the president of a... Uh, Germany, she's been taking a lead on, on accepting these refugees. And she's really paid a price, I think, politically. A lot of people think she's gone too far. She's been too liberal. This office that was thought of as beyond reach, um, suddenly it becomes, you have this black family who's moved in. And, um, and I think it, it was compounded by the recession. You had a lot of people who were um, unemployed. You know, we had tens of millions of people who were un unemployed. Um, and the country was less, very, looking very different in different ways. And I think people uh, manipulated those situations to make it look like he didn't care about you, he was opposed to you. Um, he has some sort of a other agenda. I mean, I remember talking to gun owners in Pennsylvania about eight or nine years ago. And this is at some hunting club. And and they were like, oh, yeah, he's going to come and get our guns. I mean, you've heard this kind of thing before. But to hear people saying this, you're like, what evidence is there that he's going to come and take your guns? There's no evidence. I mean, they were really like, in terms of gun control thing, they were really talking on, around the edges of change to, on gun control. They weren't saying, like, we want you to give up your guns. But they were convinced. All of them were convinced this was happening. And so they're like, just wait. You know, he's going to come for our guns. We're ready. You know, they've got their arsenal as if, like, they think they're going to hold out against the US military. All these kinds of fantasies, you know, like manhood and masculinity happening all across the country. And that's partly what you see when you hear people who are moving away from California, these parts of Idaho, is they feel like they want to create something new, you know, like their little bunker in Idaho.
I mean, some of them are literally doing that, right? But it's all part of this whole fear. Um, and uh, I think Hillary is seen as sort of just his, um, I'm not sure, protege, but you know, essentially um, inheriting his agenda. They've been sort of demonizing her just as much. But if you imagine, like, you know, after 250 years or what have you of, of white male president, suddenly you've got a black man and then a white woman, um, both liberal. Um, and this is all kinds of sort of disorientation that's happening. I think for a lot of people, Obama, you know, he's an intellectual, he's a writer, a community organizer. What are these things, you know? They're seen as being, he's kind of, um, he's not manly in the way that they think he should be. Um, and there is a very clear sort of anti-intellectual kind of a thing that's happening. And there's so many of these sites which I look at now and then. Let's just take Islam again. There's a whole industry um, that is developed around making Muslims look like scary, right? And even when they are apparently good Americans, they're the guy who's starting you know, a successful business, they're the person who's running for public office, um, you can't trust them. And there are websites um, run by these pseudo-intellectuals, people who don't have any proper degrees, um, but they use these words and they tell you, oh, we know what they're really thinking, these Muslims. You know, here's one word, it's an Arabic word. You know what this really means? It means that um, as Muslims, you're allowed to lie anytime you want to, and it's um, religiously sanctioned. So even when they, they tell you, no, I mean, I love America, and look, look at all these things I'm doing. You know, my kids in the Boy Scouts, I started this company, all that kind of stuff. So I think that, you know, there is a broader thing, and we see with creationism and how we still have this huge percentage of people who, you know, who are creationists and not just, you know, average people. You see lawmakers who believe in these things and they, and they want to resist. I mean, I, I spent a few years of my childhood in India, and I just cannot imagine a textbook having anything but scientific information about how the world started, you know? And yet we have that here. 